There you go. This week on Kentucky Afield. We're headed to far western Kentucky to squirrel hunt alongside some fellas who have been doing it for quite a while. Nearly 80 years. Right here. Next. There we go, bubble down. Winter is a great time to get out and catch big bass. Nice. And the float and fly might be one of the best methods that you can use. Then, we're hunting public land for pheasant and quail. It's all next on Kentucky Field. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> There it goes. Boom. Oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. If you were raised squirrel hunting, you already know squirrel hunting provides an excitement that you cannot outgrow. We're down here in Trigg County today and we're getting ready to do something that I don't get to do as much as I'd like, but it's always a blast. And that is squirrel hunting with dogs. So you guys brought us down here and you got a big piece of property here that's got a bunch of wildlife on it and you brought some dogs with you. What type of dogs you guys bring? They're feist. Okay, feist. So feist dogs, uh, they were kind of bred to do several different things, but squirrel hunting is what people use them the most for, isn't it? Yep. They'll tree other game, but mainly squirrels what we use ours for. Yeah. So this is a piece of property that you own, and you told me you've been squirrel hunting for a long time. What makes hunting with a dog so much more exciting? You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> I, sometimes it's chicken, sometimes it's feathers. <laughs> so how many dogs we got today? Got three. Okay, three dogs. And uh, they're all mountain feist. How many dogs you bring? Well, I've got one dog, and he's got two. Okay. Let's go meet your dogs and uh, put them on the ground. All right. Notice this is a little different style of hunting. Um, this this hillside is kind of rolling, and the terrain is rolling. So what they like to do is to let the dogs out one at a time, let the dogs hunt out in front of them, and they follow behind in the ATV. So makes for a pretty casual day of squirrel hunting. Rosie's got one tree. We got two squirrels right here. You gonna take the bottom one? Whenever you're ready. There you go. Great shot. Oh, <laughs> there they go. <laughs> well, let's walk up and see what you got. Bring here. Well, Thank you, darling. There. Well, that was a good shot. So Rosie ran over here and grabbed one of these squirrels. I don't know if she got the first one or the second one, but I found some blood. Yep, there you go. That's how it's done right there. I was born in a tent at a sawmill in 1938, and I started squirrel hunting when I was five. And we weren't sport hunting, we were hunting to eat. Yeah, oh yeah. So we killed whatever our parents wanted to cook for a meal. So that's the way I started squirrel hunting. Wow. Been doing it ever since. Can you imagine turning a five-year-old loose with a 22 now to kill? It was just a different time and place, was it? I mean, you did it out of necessity, too. Yeah. Yeah. Come 
tree won't hold still for me to shoot. Good job. Bring it here. There you go. Nice shot. That dog did a great job. Well, I'll tell you what. I appreciate you guys giving me a little bit of history about squirrel hunting today. We've talked about squirrel hunting from the time you was five years old. Unfortunately, the weather didn't cooperate for us, did it? It's got a mind of its own. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we know there's a ton of squirrels where we hunted, and the dogs did really good considering uh, the situation, but we start dealing with these wind gusts of 20, 25, 30 mile an hour. They decided to hole up on us, I think. But, uh, mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I really like. I like watching how you guys have used some of the modern day technologies of the GPS and the ATV. It kept you out here chasing these squirrels up and down these hillsides. You don't see any end in this game, do you? You're going to keep going, aren't you? That's right. <laughs> as long as I can. And I really appreciate you coming out here and uh, and and bringing your dogs and uh, and taking us on this hunt. You're very welcome. We appreciate you coming too. It's been a lot of fun. Hopefully, the next time Mother Nature will cooperate and we'll have a better hunt. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Cold weather smallmouth fishing can be extremely productive, and one of the most challenging ways to land one of these fish is on a fly rod. Well, you've been coming down here for how many years? I've been coming here since 1979. And you've been I was guiding? a senior in high school when I started coming over here. You've been guiding here for how long? Uh, 13, 13 or 14 years, I can't remember. You know, and most people know know you, you're a nighttime guy. Right, yeah. You love the nighttime fish, but at this time of year, it's cold enough during the day, you don't need to go out at night, do you? It's dangerous <laughs> to be out at night. Yeah. I have fished this time of year at night, Yeah. but I was younger, a lot younger. I'm not, it's, no, it's dangerous to be out there. I wanna be able to go tomorrow if I can. So this is kind of the technique that you have picked up for your wintertime fishing that you really enjoy. And you've perfected uh, There's it. other things that I do also that yeah. I really enjoy, but uh, this right here is, it's fun. You get every ounce of fight out of a fish. For someone who enjoys the float and fly method like you do, this is an ideal winner. You want it cold, don't you? you? You can't ask for any better than what we've had this year. Oh yeah. As far as the fish doing what you need them to do to catch them on the float, but it has been tough as far as getting out here. <laughs> I'm old and cranky, and I don't care nothing about fishing that real cold weather. I just Six, can't do it. Seven, it, I'll tell you what. Yeah, I, there's been some people out here, though, when it was in the the low teens and stuff, and my hat's off to them, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I've seen uh, I've seen enough pictures you've sent so far this year that to know you've been on some fish, <laughs> and big ones. This is a method that catches good fish. I've had two over six pounds on the float and fly. When someone hears that you're throwing a bait that small and they hear you're catching six pound fish, they almost go, I gotta see it to believe it, but I've seen it and oh, I've seen a lot oh. of people catching them. Bait smaller than that'll catch them. It'll catch them, that's for sure. A little more? I... Oh, all right, that's plenty. Oh, there, he is. there we go. There we go. on this side. There we go, bubber down. They're still wanting to come to the top of the water. It's the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's freezing cold outside. They want to up here and yeah. jump. Yeah. Watch him, he's going to come up. There you there. Beautiful fish. I tell you what, one, that, gets in your, that gets in your blood there, doesn't it? Yeah. Catch him. There we go. Big old fish like that. The big old thick, fat, healthy nice. fish like that. Nice. On a on a nine foot buggy whip. Yeah, is, look at uh, that. Look at that. That's a good one. That's there, a boys. good fish. <laughs> look, look where that bait's at. You think he wanted it right in the roof of the mouth? He eat that one. Just a little over 20. 20 inches. I'll say that's about yeah. 20 inches. I'm, I'm gonna guess. It's a good fish. Good thick, healthy yeah. fish. That fish weighs four and a half. Four and a half pounds. Yeah, good 20, solid 20 inches. That's a good one. That's a good way to get started. Uh, 
Uh-oh. Got him. There he goes. Here we go. Let's get Chad hooked up. <laughs> this is where it gets pretty exciting. You get yeah. a fish this size on a big old long rod like this. Okay, we got it doubled over. Try not to horse him too hard. Remember, it's a little hook. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to go pulling it out, do we? Uh-uh. Can't even want to come up. That's a large That's a large mouth. mouth. Sure is. <clears throat> what do you know? Hey, it catches all kinds of species. Oh, yeah, it'll catch them all. <laughs> Well, I would have never dreamed of a largemouth being on this river channel point like that, but. They do crazy things, don't they? Yeah, they go where the food's at, and he looks like he's been eating too. He's got a belly Look on him. Look at that big old belly yeah. on that joker. You know what, like I say, we come out here to try to catch brown fish, but we'll take whatever oh, we yeah. It's a bite, it's a pull down. It was a pull down. And it was fun. Bent that rod pretty good. Uh-oh, here we go. Oh, man. I thought he'd come off there. Oh, he ripped the handle out of my hand. That's a big fish right there. Yeah. There go. There's what we come looking for right there. Now you take a fish like that on a nine, nine foot rod or nine and a half foot rod and have it bent over like that fighting. I'll tell you what. You got your hands full. You do have your hands full. <laughs> That's a pretty fish right there. That is a good fish. Put a tail on that fish. That's where they get their, their power. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. What do you think, 19 and a half, 20 inches? Yeah, it probably is. That's a and good it's, fish. It's four pound fish. Off to see you another day. What we got here is braid. It's got longevity and it's got castability and it's user friendly. That's why I use it. Mm -hmm. And to use braid, I have to go with a three-way swivel mm -hmm. because you would have to wrap your line on the bobber and then it has a tendency to not want to stay in the same place. See how easy it slides up and down? So I can't use the bobber for that reason on the braid. Mm -hmm. That's the reason for the three-way swivel. Mm -hmm. A three-way swivel is, is simply just that. It's just a, it's a barrel and it's got three little leads off of it. You've tied onto one. You take and put your, your bobber on the other, on the and other. the third one is simply your, your, my leader. your leader. Right, and I'm gonna use fluorocarbon for my leader there. Okay. And I use eight pound test. All right, so there you got one left. Right. And you take your leader off here and you're going somewhere between nine and nine, nine and, and 12, 12 foot. Right, feet. I like to do 10 and a half, 11. Okay. That's, that's me. All right. Now, we've got the baits. Here comes the whole host of options that you've got yeah, here. Yeah, it's endless, really. I mean, you can use anything that imitates a minnow. This is the classic float and fly. Mm -hmm. It is a craft hair fly. You've got the hair, you've got the duck, and here's something else that I use, and it's just a plastic minnow. And they're all 16th ounce. And that's all you need for that little bait to dangle underneath that float. This is what we caught them on today. We could have probably caught them on whatever. This is right. just, this just seems to be a little bit easier. Uh oh, there you go, there you go. Mom or down. It's the it's new like wave. <laughs> of, of fish in the float and fly now. It's, it's been around for a long time. Yeah. It's a big secret for many, many years. It's, it's no secret anymore. Uh, it's, we're trying to imitate a minnow. Yeah. Why, what looks to you more, more like a minnow? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, it's a technique, that, uh, it's a technique that's fantastic for cold water. It, uh, it's something different. If you thought, you know what, I need something, I want some confidence and I want to get into wintertime fishing. This is a really good way to go out and get some confidence to catch some fish in the winter. But there's a multitude of ways to catch them. Very, yeah, float and this fly is, is just, one tool, one aspect, exactly, one way to exactly. do it. Exactly. And, and the float and fly will bring the kid out. It's a lot of fun. And I'll tell you what, I really enjoyed being out in the boat with you today. I appreciate you uh, showing us how to tie this fly up, how to present it, and hey, it works. We oh, caught yeah. fish. You caught we some good did. fish today. Yeah, I was lucky. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was thanks, lucky. Thank, thank you. I, you. I appreciate oh, you. Oh, yes. Thank you. My pleasure. Are you interested in an upland bird hunt? Well, maybe one of our quota WMA hunts is for you. We're at Clay WMA here today on the upland quail quota hunt. We're in the back of the property towards the river on the upper unit. Right now we're hunting in a native grass field, trying to find either quail or possibly a grouse. 
the weather would stay like this all day, we'd be in good shape. This is prime time. As far as I'd be feeding right about now. How big is this stuff you made again? It's uh, somewhat around 9,000 acres. Okay, and uh, what percentage open land? 20% open, 80% forested. Come on, dogs. Come on, Willie. Hey, down here. Down this way. I'm Jacob Stewart. I'm the manager here at Clay W. May, and hunting with me today is uh, Ben Robertson, our assistant director for the Wildlife Division, and Zach Danks, our grouse and turkey coordinator. Here! Come on! I want y'all to picture something right here. There's a hunter who came around and his dog was pointed right there by that tree. Oh, he's holding tight. It was beautiful. Hunter comes around behind him, pushes the bird about, I don't know, 10 yards away. Boom, boom! Bird flies off. It was terrible. I mean, you remember that, Zach? You remember that, Zach? Do we know that, Hunter? You're talking about you remember that, Zach? Fabrication. You remember that, Zach? Total fabrication. <laughs> Quail hunt? No, pheasant hunt. Pheasant flies, lands in a tree across the road. Boom! Somebody else shoots the bird. <laughs> Thanks for uh, pointing that out. No, don't worry. I've shot at so few wild quail this year when we do get something up. Yeah, you may not remember what to do. I'm probably going to be about 10 feet behind them. <laughs> <laughs> the upper quota hunt has 12 units, 300s per party. I see some hunters way over on that other top of that hill way over there. Oh, I got you now, I see him. Okay, we got them both pointed. No, Willie, no, Willie. Good boy, Blue, good boy. So we're, what, a week past the uh, pheasant hunt on this WMA? The pheasant hunt is a put and take hunt that we have here at Clay WMA. Uh, we've been doing it for oh, somewhere around 17 years uh, for the opportunity for people to hunt. We put out oh, 420 birds and have uh, 70 hunters for three days come out and shoot. Rooster! We're in the cleanup period from now to the end of the year and we've gotten up two or three on this quail quota hunt. That was a beautiful rooster. We're put forth with uh, the mission to manage the habitat on here and make it suitable for uh, good hunting opportunities for the public uh, to come and enjoy themselves and uh, hopefully encounter game and have a good enjoyable hunt. This is a pretty grousey little edge it looks like. I can see grouse being in there. This is one of the annual food plots. It's Milo that they plant and uh, they're not always the best places to hunt honestly. The bigger value for quail management is the ground disturbance. So Jacob will come in here and he'll plant this this year, but he'll leave it alone for a year or two. And a lot of just natural plants will come back. You get a lot of ragweeds, desmodium, the little stick tights that stick to your hunting pants. Uh, that's the stuff that quail really love. So the bigger benefits are gonna probably come next year when this starts to come back. I think we should probably keep going straight ahead here and hit that creek. Hey, look for Blue up there. He says he's on point in front of you. He's in front of me. Is he pointing? Yep. Not sure there's any birds in here, though. Sure was. Covey. Quail? Yeah, it was a quail. It was a covey. Wasn't expecting that. Blue nailed him, and Lucy had her head up like this, but she's so tired. She'd... I didn't give her enough credit. And they, uh... Do we need to come over there and chase them? Yeah, we probably should. How many were there? Um, I'd say there was at least 10 birds. Next year, we won't have the quota hunt. Uh, next year, the Clay WMA is gonna be open to grouse and quail two days a week, Mondays and Saturdays. Easy, dog. That's where they went, Zach. Look in the hunting guide to make sure everything goes through. But as of right now, the commission has passed that to allow more opportunity for hunting. Looks like they're held tight. They sure did. 
This is probably where the birds have been all day is in this woody cover because we haven't been finding them in the grass. A lot of times people overlook this stuff, they don't hunt in here. You're looking at 16 days worth of, worth of being able to come here and chase some, yeah. some quail on grass. By stopping December 31st, we're, you know, we're cutting it off when winter will get severe and hawk migration, that kind of thing. You're gonna have a lot of birds just taken naturally, so it's, uh, it's why we're trying to be conservative on an area that really focuses on management, is, is that right? Yeah, because this is a both a quail and a grouse focal area. So uh, it is important that we, you know, uh, try not to make uh, hunting pressure additive. I mean, these are, it's like grouse hunting in here. You shoot a tree every time you're shooting at a bird. Good boy. I'd say though, people probably don't want to emulate our kind of hunting pressure. I <laughs> know, our, our hunting pressure is, yeah, uh, yeah. is no, uh, it's not really pressure at all. Nah, we just keep, keep, keep the birds exercising though. Okay, we got them both pointed, 50 yards. This way? Yeah, toward that tall tree. Both of them pointed? Both of them. Easy, Willie, easy. They're both pointing your way. Easy, Willie. Whoa. 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 There they go. Dang. Good Lord, look at them climb. Look at them. They're still climbing. <gasps> there go. Wow, good dog. Good dog. That was a nice cover right there. It sure was. Wow, oh, golly. man, there was a bunch of birds in there. Wow. God, that was pretty. I just, it was so far out and it was in there. I, there was no way I was gonna be able to pick out a bird. Oh, it's just, I mean, look where they are, right here on the edge. Rank native grasses, blackberry briars, and into the woods, across the draw. Ain't this fun? Oh, man, it's a, it's a blast. Uh, there's nothing better than a day behind a bird dog and uh, just watch them work. We sure have fun with it. Oh, we, we sure work do. Hard. Uh, this is just uh, one of those days you look forward to all year. All year. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Check out seven-year-old Braden Jackson with his first deer ever, a super wide buck that he took on his papa's property in Grayson County. Here we have 10-year-old Taylor McClure who killed this nice eight-point buck who interestingly enough only had three legs. This deer was taken in Webster County. Here we have Laura Rose with a nice largemouth bass that she caught in a farm pond in Shelby County. She said she loves Kentucky afield. Nice fish. Here we have Bryson Hagen with a nice seven point buck. This was his very first buck ever and he took it on his papaw's farm. Nice job. Check out the beautiful color of this nice smallmouth bass caught by Jaden. Jaden caught this in Bullet County and it's his biggest smallmouth bass ever. Nice job. Check out this huge flathead catfish that was caught by Chris Payton from Shelbyville, Kentucky. This fish was caught by using a bluegill as bait caught in pool four in the Kentucky River. Here we have McKenna Steffen with her first deer ever, a nice buck that was taken on the last day of muzzleloader season. This buck was taken in California, Kentucky. Congratulations, McKenna. Here we have Jim Williamson of Hardin County, Kentucky. He caught these two nice striper down at Lake Cumberland fishing with their old buddy, Lance Sasser. Here we have nine-year-old Briar Phillips holding his first squirrel ever. He shot this with his papaw's gun while hunting with his squirrel dog, Rosie. Nice job. If you plan on hitting the water this winter for some outdoor recreation, make sure you take the appropriate precautions. Make sure you wear your life jacket and also take a change of clothes just in case you get wet. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water. If you hold a Kentucky hunting or fishing license, then you have helped make possible Kentucky's wildlife management areas, places to hunt, fish, bird watch, or just let your mind wander. With nearly 100 dotting the Commonwealth, put wildlife management areas in your sights and see more of what makes Kentucky's outdoors outstanding. Get all the info online at fw.ky.gov. Let's go. More Kentucky Afield is available at your fingertips. 
Whether by smartphone or computer, you'll find exclusive content and behind the scenes videos on our social media pages. Give us a like or follow to stay in the woods and on the water longer. When you subscribe to us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, just search Kentucky Field on your favorite app.